Uh, yeah, I know. Maybe I'll uh, I'll just start, uh, and then uh, we'll figure it out. So uh, I'll just say a couple of things about the seminar in general uh, before I start talking about cubicle sets. And so the idea is to you know make it uh, make it an introduction to cubicle sets and showcase some of the um, recent work that uh, some people have done. And uh, I think it's a very interesting topic and. Uh, for some reason, it has its renaissance now. Um, yeah, so we're making cubicle sets great again, really. Um, and it makes sense in that cubicle sets actually precede simplicial sets. Uh, uh, so Khan was first using cubicle sets before uh, simplicial sets were introduced, and then simplicial sets somehow took over. But uh, yeah, we're trying to bring the glory days of the 50s back. Um, I know if that's a good statement to advertise things by, but uh, I'll, I'll go with that. And so, uh, yeah, uh, the, my, my talk today is essentially just introducing the very basic notions. And as I said, I, I feel like if that was a Blackboard talk, it would take uh, at the most 20 minutes, uh, but I've never done a tablet talk. And I've been using a tablet for not very long, so I don't really know how to do that. So it may take longer, which I apologize for. And um, I think that um, that would be about it. Oh, and one other thing is, please ask me questions or make comments or you know insults uh, as much as, as you'd like. Uh, I think uh, like for the whole series of talks, all the talks that we're going to have, I hope we can have a lot of discussion and a lot of interaction rather than just uh, one person talking. Um, so this is, yeah, uh, uh, it's just still a relatively young subject, at least uh, the, the second wave, uh, one might say. So, um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. So I'll start now, okay. Um, so I want to define cubicle sets, and before I do that, let me just quickly remind you uh, what simplicial sets are. And I understand that we actually don't need to do that, but we're going to do that anyway. And uh, I'm doing it just to record the main differences. Um, so let's see, recall. Uh, and we're going to define cubicle sets in a, in a similar way, but it's good to keep in mind the differences. Uh, some personal sets, well, these are just pre sheaves on uh, the KVD delta. Uh, so there is, um, there is this KVD where delta is um, a sub KVD, say, of cat, and it's a full sub KVD, and that's important whose objects are uh, things of the form. And in brackets, and this is just zero less than one, less than up to n. And then uh, morphisms, well, morphisms, you know what they are because I just told you, uh, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. But morphisms uh, are monopole maps. Monopole maps. And also, I note that I just lied. It's not the reason. The reason why you know what the maps in delta are is not because I told you, but I told you and you knew before. Uh, okay, so now uh, if you look at uh, those things, so just for a simple example, uh, here we have two, and if you draw a picture of this category, it exactly looks like a simplex. Okay, great, so it has uh, three objects and the morphisms and things like that. Okay, so if you want to define cubicle sets, uh, well, what we need to do is uh, do pretty much the same thing. So uh, we're going to define, oh, sorry. Uh, that's, that's not what I meant to write. Uh, it's not cubicle object in uh, cubicle sets. So it's, it's going to be a pre-shift category and then uh, the question is, what's this? Well, it would be reasonable um, to expect that this will be a category and it's going to have some objects. 
Um, and these objects, well, these will be n-dimensional cubes. So you can write them as this kind of gadget. Um, and uh, right, so one in brackets is the same notation I used before. So this is zero less than or equal to one. Um, and you can just view them as subsets of a set with n elements. Okay, and so uh, maybe um, if, you, if you've never seen cubicle sets before, uh, you have this temptation that I certainly had at the beginning to just say um, that this is a full subcategory of cat with these objects. And this is, um, I mean, once you follow this temptation, you quickly realize that, um, you know, this, this, is, this is exactly, uh, uh, this is maybe uh, the same as overeating. Um, so while we're defining uh, the cube category as that, it's, it's very nice, elegant definition. Like we don't need to say anything about uh, morphisms, but the problem is that we feel terrible afterwards. And been there, done that, trust me, you don't want to go there. Um, so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say that um, this, uh, so maybe maps in a cube are generated, are generated by, and there are a few uh, distinguished classes that will generate all the maps. So we're going to take certain monotone maps, uh, the smallest subcategory that contains the following maps. The first thing is we want to take faces of cubes. So, uh, so there are face maps. And how do face maps work? Well, um, a face map is a map of that form. And so these are the, uh, indexed by i and epsilon where i is a number between one and n, and epsilon is a number between zero and one. And uh, the way you think about it is, well, when you have, so, uh, so, oh, sorry, before I say the way you think about it, I should tell you what it does. So a map like that, and you take the string from x1 to x and minus one, it's just gonna insert epsilon at spot i. So you're going to get x1 up to xi minus 1, epsilon, and then xn minus 1. Okay? And what that corresponds to is, for instance, uh, when you draw the picture of a square, right? So if you take n equal to 2 uh, on the level of uh, p shifts on this category, uh, let's say that this is my square. Hey, Chris, um, just so oh, you know that sorry. you're you're sort of pushing things to the top and off the screen, like as soon as you write them, more or less. So, oh, and that's yeah. not good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, just always try to be writing at the bottom, uh, but uh, oh, that's good. Carry on. Oh, yeah. That would be, that's a pretty good idea. Also, because I think it keeps switching between the eraser and the pen when I touch the screen with my head. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, great, thank you, yes. Um, so if I call this square F, <laughs> so I don't know, um, so this is I think the most I can display at once. Um, and uh, let's call these directions something. So if this is the first direction and this is the second direction, oh, this is an ugly one. It looks almost like a European one and that's a proper American one, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there are four faces of the square and I should be able to, uh, so this for instance is delta. This is obtained by setting index two to zero. This is obtained by setting index two to one. This is obtained by setting index one to one. And this is obtained by setting index uh, one to zero. Okay, so. Uh, the thing is the direction, the coordinates are ordered and that's kind of a big deal. Okay, so these are face maps. Um, so I'll push that much maybe, and then uh, I'm gonna tell you uh, about, the generacy, about the degeneracy maps. 
turn the address in that. Okay. Um, so the generators go in the opposite direction as you may have expected. Um, so uh, the, I'm going to call that sigma i. And i here ranges from 1 to n. Okay. Uh, uh, and what sigma what sigma i does to the string uh, to a string of that form x n, it just drops x i. So it is x one, and then we remove x i from the sequence, and then we go to x n. And um, so uh, yeah. So now if you uh, if you instantiate it with uh, let's say n equal uh, to two there are two ways of viewing let's say a map like that i'm going to write it as f from a to b as a degenerate square so one way is in which uh, one way um so let's say sigma one so i'm uh, removing the first direction so in the first direction i should see the degeneracy so I'm going to have a, a, and then b, b, and then I'm going to have f here and f here. And there's a different way of doing it, namely, um, I can do sigma 2 and get a, a, b, b, and now I'm going to have qualities here and uh, f's. So this is f uh, sigma one, and this is f sigma two. Okay, cool. Um, so this is uh, what's known as the, uh, so let me say that faces plus the generacies, the generacies uh, give you uh, what's known as the minimal, minimal cube category um and that's yeah that's kind of the very minimum of uh, what you need in order to do uh cubicle sets in any reasonable way um and yeah people have studied that quite a lot so uh, it goes back to i, I think Rotten did observe that uh, this is somehow a minimal test category i don't exactly know what that means um but maybe I'll learn on Wednesday uh, in Brandon's talk. And uh, Cizinski and Peter Dean and uh, a lot of other people studied this category. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a nice category. But okay, then you can start adding more maps. If that was not enough, you can start adding what's called connections. Oh, sorry. I have one other comment here to, to make, is that you'll quickly realize that uh, there's a problem with products. Uh, problem with products. So in CAT, it's of course the case that 1 to the power of n times 1 to the power of n is isomorphic to, at the very least, to 1 to the power of n plus n. Um, but we um, somehow removed maps from this category that, uh, so this is not true, not true in this minimal uh, cube category. And so, um, yeah, we removed maps that would witness that. So there's, for instance, uh, no diagonal inclusion. Uh, for instance, no, uh, or even or even better, there's no symmetry map uh, from one squared to itself, right? So uh, if you take the product of something with itself, it better have a symmetry map, and this one doesn't. Why? Well, because if I have x1 and x2, I can never swap the order. All the op like I can either, either drop things from my sequence or I can include zeros and ones in my sequence, but I can never swap the order of the things. 
And in fact, the product and cubicle sets are really, really badly behaved. So um, uh, you have the geometric realization function, realization, um, and so that's going to be a functor. Well, I have a functor to top that sends one to the n to, uh, let's say, the unit interval to the power of n. You have the unit embedding right here, and you can left can extend, obtaining the geometric realization. And if you look at what the product, the Cartesian product of cubical sets, uh, does is when you take the geometric realization of the product of the interval with itself, that's going to have the homotopy type of S1 wedge S2. So somehow there's not enough degeneracies to distinguish between two copies of the square that you'll be gluing in. And so it's going to be like a two copies of square glued along the boundary with an extra diagonal in the middle. And uh, if you think about it geometrically, that's exactly S1 wedge S2. Um, so clearly that's not the operation um, that, uh, I mean, so, so uh, in topological spaces, that's, uh, that's not how it should be, uh, uh, you, may, you may say. Okay, so maybe you want to start adding more maps just to be able to see these, um, these products better. So the next thing you can add is you can add connections. And connections, um, I'm not exactly sure uh, where, uh, where the name came from. Um, and, uh, but okay, the, there's, these are some extra degeneracies and they are of this form. And so what gamma i does uh, at the string x1 to xn is it takes maximum of um, xi and xi plus one, um, and then everything else stays the same. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So let me, let me do another example of, uh, of that. Like what does it mean geometrically? Again, I'm gonna look at the case of n equal to two. And so there should be one such map. And I'm gonna take string x1, x2 to the maximum. And so, um, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is this, if I have, uh, let's say, uh, one cube f, um, I can send it to, uh, something that looks like that. So, oh, and that's of course not what I wanted to say. Uh, let's check, I need to write this. Okay, so this is now F, and maybe if F was from A to B, this is A, this is B, this is B, and this is B, and this is F again, right? So this is again something that we couldn't express using, um, using uh, the previous. So I still don't have products, but at least up to uh, homotopy equivalence, products are now well behaved. So uh, products well behaved, well behaved up to um, uh, homotopy equivalence. So I get the right homotopy type, even though, okay, and so. Another thing you can add, uh, there will be also min connections. So the previous connections were max connections. These are, you can also add min connections. Um, and so I'm gonna leave it as an exercise to figure out what these maps do <laughs> and uh, draw an analogous picture. Okay, but uh, maybe you're still not done. Uh, because maybe you want to throw in uh, some more maps. So there's something called symmetric cubicle. So cubicle sets to which you add connections are called, and that's not designed to confuse you, uh, cubicle sets with connections. Um, but uh, there's something called symmetric cubicle sets. And so for those, we use symmetries. And so symmetries are maps 
which I don't have a good notation for because I'm not uh, very uh, familiar with, but um, uh, but I think the common notation would be just to denote them using um, the corresponding symmetry or the co uh, corresponding permutation. And so you can imagine what those would do. They would just permute the singletons. Uh, and so you would get x1, oh, so x tau1 up to x tau n. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you think about what this thing does, uh, it does the exact thing you would want it to. So it swaps uh, those two uh, things, right? So uh, uh, it flips the the uh, core the co the coordinates, right? And uh, that's what symmetries do. Okay. So now these are usually called uh, symmetric. Cubical sets. So this is what you get when you take faces, uh, degeneracies, and uh, symmetries. Uh, so if you want to also add connections, this would be called symmetric cubical sets with connection. Again, these uh, these names are uh, kind of uh, yeah, not uh, not designed for this. And then there are diagonals. Um, which is uh, a whole new level of complication. Uh, and so there's 99% chance that I'll screw up indices on that one. Uh, so what diagonals let you do is they let you repeat indices uh, or repeat, um, repeat things. So we're gonna go from one to one N plus K. And so this is a diagonal indexed by N K and then I. Um, okay, so how does that work? Um, well, so what a diagonal like that does at I is um, X1 up to Xn. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count to I and then I'm gonna repeat the next K uh, things. So I'm gonna go x1 up to xi. Then I'm gonna go xi plus one up to xi plus k. Then I'm gonna repeat this string. Um, and then I'm gonna finish with xn. So you can repeat an arbitrary substring. A substring. And the intuition here comes from um, the case of n equal to one and k equal to one, where this is uh, this is the thing that you would expect to see. Example, okay, uh, where uh, if I call this thing f, um, this diagonal delta um, one one, and I guess that's going to be zero. Uh, takes this to a map, maybe, maybe I'll put it, sorry. Uh, put this one like that, and then, okay, so this is F delta zero one one. Okay, great. Um, so uh, now you have the diagonals and uh, let me let me just make a couple of observations real quick about these definitions. So, uh, observation is that uh, if you have degeneracies plus diagonals, uh, then you automatically have symmetries. Um, and so, uh, so this is the only exercise that I can show. So I'm not going to leave it as an exercise. So how do I do that? Well, if I can repeat an arbitrary string, then I can in particular uh, do that. Uh, I can repeat the whole thing, and then I can drop this thing, and I can drop this thing, and get x2, x1. So uh, if you're considering diagonals, then symmetries come for sure. 
a quick question question about that, Chris. Oh, yeah. Um, So it seems like you're assuming something extra that wasn't what you wrote down originally, where originally you wrote down the diagonals take a single um, xi and repeat it some number No, no. Do I have that wrong? No, no. They they take the step string xi plus 1 to xi plus k, Mm -hmm. right, where they take a whole string and repeat it right here. Okay, so when you're adding diagonals, you're assuming that. Yeah, yeah, so so this is why I'm indexing diagonals with both k and i. Mm-hmm. I get to choose the length of the string, like, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. Um, this is, I think, what is usually meant by diagonals uh, for uh, cubicle sets. Um, I think repeating a single one is also an interesting operation, but they've never seen it considered by itself. So it would be something interesting to, I know look at maybe um but yeah uh i'm mean, so oh, sorry go ahead i was just gonna say these uh diagonals allow you to recover the repeating a single one once you if you also have to generate these right uh so you can you can repeat yeah you can repeat a single one but you can also repeat uh, a longer string but if you only can repeat a single one then uh you would never put x1 in front of x2 right like that's the that's the trick we're doing in this uh, observation here. Uh, yeah, sorry. And, and I mean, part, part of the thing is, is, is it, the reason that, one reason why you, you would want to have diagonals for everything is that you want, is when you're adding diagonals, you want to get a Cartesian monoidal category, right? And uh, right, yeah. so it would be, le- be less clear kind of from a logical perspective what you're doing if, if you just added that diagonals for a single object. Um, right. But yeah, yeah, maybe it would be interesting. Um, yeah, so I will say you, that diagonals for just the single object will come up on Wednesday, extremely. <laughs> okay, we're, great. Yeah. So, so then I won't say anything about them, but I'm going to give you an exercise. Um, uh, and the exercise is that if you do faces plus the generalities plus connections um, plus diagonals, then you ended up with full subcategory of cat. So, uh, so I mean, that's just a, a thing that you can prove. In fact, if you're teaching a sufficiently nice undergraduate course, and you don't phrase it as we're studying this pre shift category, but uh, you know, phrase it in a slightly different way about, as a question about combinatorics of process. You can give it to your undergraduate students. They can, uh, this is using both connections? With that. Using both connections, yeah. Uh, so without the other connection, I think, like, if you don't have one of the connections, you won't be able to write that connection as, <laughs> uh, like, already at level, like, two to one, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so that's great. Uh, so now we know the maps that we may want to be working with. And so I want to maybe uh, say a couple of things about some other constructions that we usually perform on cubicle sets in order, like when we work with them. And um, these constructions are again uh, those, kinds of, those, those kinds of things that uh, will come up a lot, and you can have them in all kinds of cubicles. So, uh, so I'm going to be uh, uh, agnostic, agnostic about uh, the cube category, um, uh, wh- which one I chose, but uh, most of these things should work for all choices, or all of, all of the things I'm going to say should work for, or not should, it's not, do work for all. A quick question, Chris. Okay, so are, you gonna say anything about, are you going to say anything about reversals? I was not planning on it. Okay. That's fine. I, that... I, I, I might say something about reversals. Okay. Um, okay. If you want, I can say something about reversals. No, go, no you don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I won't worry about it. Okay, so the first observation is that 
there is a uh, there is a monoidal product in this category. Um, oh, sorry, this is not this. Uh, in this category, we want to be zero. Uh, where so this is a monoidal category, monoidal category where one m and say one n uh, is defined to be one to the power of m plus m. And yeah, uh, I think this it's an easy exercise that this is really <laughs> uh, a monoidal category. So I'm going to go the proposition. Um, Okay, and so now what you can do is you can try to, uh, you can define what's known as the geometric product of cubicle sets. Geometric product, geometric product of cubicle sets. Um, so you just take this product. I mean, so yeah, I, th I think there's, there's a fancy name for it. Uh, uh, meaning a big convolution. Well, it's not that fancy. Uh, oh, sorry, that's it. Uh, close enough. Cubicle sets. Okay, so this is this. And so you embed it into cubicle sets times cubicle sets. Um, yeah, and the resulting functor is uh, the geometric product. And so that's the product that geometrically well behaved because we made it geometrically well behaved, right? So this is the geometric product uh, that's, um, uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that behaves well with respect to uh, uh, geometric realization. And another observation is that once you have product in your, cat in your cube category, uh, then so, with diagonals, uh, what you get is that uh, this monoid product coincides with the Cartesian product. Okay, um, but without diagonals, they differ. So, without symmetries, um, uh, it's easy to see that, uh, of course. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I just, I just I see this. So this is not isomorphic to uh, cube one times uh, cube one. Uh, this because this one again has symmetry, and the other one doesn't. Okay. Um, another thing that you may want to do is you may want to compare uh, cubicle sets with simplicial sets. And so for that, there's the notion of triangulation. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, triangulation is, uh, it's a, well, it's a functor. Uh, and so uh, it arises from the fact that whichever cube category we may want to consider, uh, it is a subcategory of cap. Full or not, it is a subcategory. And uh, here, I'm actually that, that's actually one place where I'm not sure what reversals uh, do for you because if you have reversals, then you're no longer the subcategory. So, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe let me say what I was going to say, and then uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna disagree or uh, not. Um, so. Uh, the norm functor takes you to simplicial sets. Um, and now, again, you're gonna uh, embed it and you're gonna left can extend it. Uh, so T is just the left can extension of this. So this is none. And if we look at what that does, um, this sends uh, this way to the simplex to the power uh, 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 one simplex to the power of that. And so, uh, yeah, uh, you know how to triangulate each of the cubes and then you extend it by, by colors. Okay, and so triangulation 
uh, admit an agent, uh, u and ux. N is a, that's just abstract nonsense, but I'll, I'll, I apologize for uh, to, to everyone whose intelligence is now offended by me spelling out these things, but I think they are well worth spelling out. So uh, yeah, uh, the the other functor, the right adjoint of triangulation, which denoted U, um, is uh, yeah is given by just coming out of uh, cubes encoded as simple actual sets, and so maybe one thing. Uh, maybe one thing to note is uh, that uh, you're gonna. The, uh, this is a non-trivial operation, right? So if I start with a cube, like if I do something like uh, cube two, uh, and then I triangulate it, and then I uh, move it back to a cubical set, that's obviously not the same as uh, the thing I started with, which is the observation, um, unless unless you're dealing with unless have diagonals, and why that's true, there are several interesting arguments for that. Um, one is, uh, and that's my favorite argument. Uh, one is that once you have the full set category, then there is a topology on that category. And cubical sets become pre-sheaves for that topology, where the simplicial sets are sheaves. And so, and triangulation becomes uh, the sheafification of a pre-sheaf. But if you, uh, if you start it with a sheaf, then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have a, uh, you're gonna get the sheaf still. So, uh, I, I think that's, that's I, I think, uh, what I said is uh, just it, it justifies. Uh, just okay. Um, okay. Last comment that I'll make uh, is uh, there's also a cubical analog of the Lel factor. Uh, so again, there's not much to say here. So there's the Lel factor that allows you to consider any category as a cubical set instead of a simplicial set, and that simply sends um, uh, a cubical set um, to, uh, let's see, so these are functors from one to the n to c, so that's something like, th th there's uh, a functor like that. Um, oh, sorry, maybe, maybe I should say another thing. So, uh, in in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to say that uh, we can define can define uh, well the boundary of an n cube, and so here I'm going to assume that I don't have uh, I'm working either uh, either in minimal minimal or with connections so you can be work, working with both connections so once you have symmetries and diagonals um, things become a bit weird because what's the boundary is boundary really the boundary or is it the maximum uh, sub complex containing something but if you um, if you're in a nice ready setting and Tim will say something about it in a second, then it's very clear what this should be. And similarly, you can define what's called, so this is the boundary. And you can define uh, what's known as open boxes. Hey, sorry, Chris, in a... Uh... I'm wondering why you said sort of with connection. Oh, I see. So, I mean, the, the the question is whether the diagonals are part of the boundary or not. The diagonal faces. Yeah. So if you right. if you just had minimal plus connections, then you don't have any diagonal faces. So the boundary is still the geometric boundary. Uh, right. Yeah. So if you don't, yeah, exactly. When you don't have diagonals, the boundary is the boundary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> whereas. Yeah. 
if, if you have diagonals, the boundary is the boundary and diagonal and the, and diagonals. Maybe. Right. Uh, but but then things stop being greedy, and it's also like harder to uh, say. Uh, like if yeah, you have connections and diagonals, things that okay. So this is uh, so open boxes. This is just the boundary without uh, the uh, i epsilon phase. And I just have one final comment uh, about this notation for open boxes. This is the worst way of opening boxes. If you think about uh, like what this represents geometrically, absolutely never open your yeah. If you if you got like uh, a delivery from Apple with your fancy iPhone or something, and you open your box this way, that's not a good idea. Uh, so the notation is a bit confusing. Um, but yeah, uh, with that. Wait, I don't get it. I don't. Complexes. What's wrong? Is it because it's on? Yeah bottom in the picture? No, in the picture is open to the bottom, right? So, okay. uh, yeah, the joke uh, requires uh, familiarity with uh, some concepts of physics, I see. Uh, like gravity, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway, maybe I'll, 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 I'll stop here. All right, I think we need to thank Chris for that uh, stunning performance, so. <laughs> <laughs> Questions or other banter? Um, so I have a question. I guess, I think you said a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm still sort of struggling with thinking about the connections, like why there's sort of a natural controlled class of maps to add in if you're trying to understand this like variance of the Q category. Right, okay, so, uh, uh, so, um, I mean, in some sense, you can argue that, like, they don't add anything, I mean, they are a useful sort of degeneracy, and there are certain things, um, there are certain things that I don't know how to prove for minimal cubicle sets, and I know how to prove for, uh, for cubicle sets with connections, but, uh, and, and there will be a talk about it. Uh, there will be a talk about it next week where uh, we can write certain functor, uh, specifically straightening over the point, or even a uh, homotopy coherent nerve involving cubicle sets or cubicle categories that requires you to have at least a maximum connection, not necessarily minimum. But uh, since we're gonna have talks about that separately, I'm gonna mention a different theorem. So maybe. Draw a line here, and I'm going to say there's a theorem due to George uh, Maltzinetti's. Maltzinetti's. Oh. Um, and so it says that the category of cubicle sets with connections, let me denote it this way, is a strict test category. Strict test category. And so that's an important property. Um, so that, for instance, means that the geometry realization is uh, well behaved. Uh, um, whereas if you if you do uh, cubicle sets, like let's say minimal, minimal uh, is a test category, but not a strict test category, but not uh, a strict. So, um, yeah, and, and yeah, so, uh, and another answer, I'll just record it here. You need connections for, um, let's see, homotopy coherent nerve, homotopy coherent nerve, and uh, straightening, straightening. Uh, if I wrote it without any mistakes, that would be uh, a reason to celebrate. So I, th I think, um, so I, I guess I would say that the reason for connections uh, is not that uh, they, they necessarily feel right, but uh, ultimately we, we need them for, uh, for things like that. And 
Um, I'm pretty sure that the speaker for homotopic equilibrium nerve will explain why they are uh, very much needed. I mean, I'm the speaker, so <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I don't want to hog all the questions. Maybe a quick, like a quick follow up. Like, so what was what were like what were the obstructions to cubicle sets being you know useful 50 years ago? Was it that they like didn't have the connections or something else? Um, that's a uh, yeah. That's another yeah. That's a, that's a that's a great question. And I think um, the main problem was just the uh, success of um, uh, success of simplicial sets. So for instance, uh, there is this problem with the Cartesian product, right? The Cartesian product is not exactly work that well. Uh, like you need this geometric product. But as for simplicial sets, Cartesian product is the product. So a lot of things work perfectly when we look at spaces in simplicial sets. So maybe a better analogy would be <laughs> Uh, rather than bringing back the 50s, would be uh, 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 MySpace and Facebook. Uh, so cubicle sets were uh, kind of like MySpace, um, but now we need to bring MySpace back. And uh, yeah, and I think, okay, that, that's a really bad analogy. Like that's really like no one will come back to the seven now. Well, maybe one thing to say is that uh, I, I think I think one thing you suggested, Morgan, which which I think is probably correct, is that originally people didn't have the the connections in the category, and even when Brown and Higgins introduced the connections, Spencer. they didn't form the. Sorry, is it Spencer or is oh, it? Oh, oh, is it maybe someone else? Okay, my my impression was that uh, when the connections were first introduced, they weren't introduced. They were not introduced as structure in to make a appreciative category they were just like there exists a, they're you know like they were kind of like horn filling oh, it is again. sorry uh, you're right tim oh. well now that i unmuted myself yeah, okay. one well, comment uh one could make is uh, so every one knows that every simplicial group is a Kahn complex but the corresponding statement isn't true for minimal cubicle sets however it is true for cubicle sets with connections so that's one other uh, thing to say that's another sort of early results showing why cubicle sets with connections are nice. Uh, yeah, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. And then, yeah, the, the other thing uh, about the work of Brown and others is, yeah, for them, a connection was something that would be a thing on a con complex. So, con complex would have uh, fillers for these open boxes. And so, you can use these to define. Con complexes. Um, so, well, define, con, they are not con complexes, but you can use them to define con complexes in very much the same way you, you define con complexes in uh, some plural sets. Uh, and then connections would be just something extra, uh, would, would be another one of those conditions. Uh, but it seems like adding them to the indexing category is a more natural solution. Sorry. Okay, yeah. And then just adding on to that, it seems like um, when people move to the simplex category that these very convenient properties it has, as far as I see it, I'm, I'm actively searching for counterexamples to this, but it seems like most of that nice structure of the simplex category comes from either being a strict test category or having a particularly having a canonical, in a sense, nerve functor from categories and cubicle sets with connection have, or rather the, the cube category with connections has at least the strict test category part. And so a lot of that is, a lot of that is there for the same reason. And I'm gonna talk about that next week, or next talk, not next week. Yeah, on Wednesday. Uh, our Okay. <laughs> Maybe another thing to reassure you, Morgan, about connections is that is that when you add in the connections, you still have a reedy category, and in fact, you still have an elegant reedy category. So if if you're worried about it being like, oh, the you know you get crazy like combinations of these things that like are, there's no way to like kind of 
bring order to like the category that these things generate, like you shouldn't worry too much about that because you, you, you know, it, you at least kind of comb them out into like really type factorizations and stuff. I, I don't know what an, an elegant reedy category is, but it sounds nice. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that a little bit in my next in my, in my talk. Chris, can I ask a question? Go for it. Um, I'm a little bit confused about uh, a couple of the pictures. So like under mm -hmm. diagonals. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so why do we have a square on the left for f um, if x is n equals 1? Uh, because uh, the diagonal goes to uh, from n equal, like I, I'm taking n equal 1, k equal 1. And so you start with something that's n plus k dimensional, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I got it. So, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. And that answers yeah. my other question that's similar. So, <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think like when it comes to diagonals, at least I don't have like very good notation, and um, maybe I should like a magician shouldn't reveal all the tricks, uh, but I can reveal that like if you look at let's say um, like all the other maps, I said specifically what ranges over what, uh, and when you look at diagonals nothing was said about this and yeah uh, i think that would just be a mess so uh, i think i made it particularly confusing just to uh, uh, make it just not to make it even more confusing <laughs> uh, yeah um, thanks <laughs> Uh, what notation did you use for the face maps? Because you got delta for the diagonals. I forgot what you used. Yeah, for so I used the partial. Use a partial. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Fancy. That's what I was going for. That's my style. Yeah. <laughs> and then, what were your degeneracies? How were they notated? Uh, I also use the Greek letter. Uh, it's sigma, I think. Yeah, it's sigma. Yeah. I feel like we should go with degeneracies and connections, like the two different type scripts of an E. You know, there's like the epsilon that's like curvy, and then there's the one that's like a, a backwards three. <laughs> oh, know, so like. <laughs> Wait, so are you saying, like, well, I can't, I can't do it with Henry. Just to make are this as impenetrable that... as possible. Yeah, there's that one, and then there's the one that's like the half moon with a line in it. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, a, the, the, the... there's a var sigma as well when it occurs yeah, at the end of the word. Yeah, it's the var sigma, that's right, yeah. Or, yeah. Well, right, we could do var sigma. <laughs> Just have a composition okay. of these with lots of indices. What is var sigma? Oh, yeah, yeah, and then you have, and then we have partial with epsilon, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, we need to have some abbreviations for. Yeah. Right. Right, and epsilon, of course, is also either zero or one. You know, that's a completely right. different usage, so that's fine. <laughs> so. And yeah, subscripts don't count. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so Alex says that we should use a snake or something. Uh, well, that's that's uh, a var sigma. It doesn't the this sort of text version doesn't really look like uh, a proper the proper Greek letter, but it does have a bit of a snaky appearance. Uh, yeah, it's really. This is what a sigma looks like when it occurs at the end of a word in Greek. It's um, it's also like the uh, neck and the head of a dragon. So. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, so maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a good moment to take a little break uh, because a lot of questions I think will also be answered uh, in Tim's talk. Uh, so why don't we take like a five minute break and then, uh, oh yeah, what do you take? Great letters in Egypt. Okay, so uh, I'll stop the recording and we can, uh, we can discuss that and uh, resume maybe 10 past five.